that was a very, very good motor race. Such a shame we don't have the Nürburgring, the new Nürburgring on the calendar more often. Let's hope that from here on in, it becomes a fixture. The Eiffel Grand Prix and the German Grand Prix at Hockenheim, if it's going to happen. Uh, yeah, a great circuit, good race. There was lots going on, wasn't there? The temperature made the, the, the cold ambient made it really interesting in terms of temperatures, tyre temperatures, managing the car on cold tyres and then managing graining thereafter. We saw a lot of that. And in the end, it was a Lewis Hamilton victory, a very good win because a lot of pressure from Max Verstappen throughout the race when they were managing tyres, first on the soft, then on the yellow medium. And then after a safety car restart, everybody back onto the onto new sets of softs. And at that moment, the tires were not up to temperature. Anything could have happened. But Lewis timed the, timed the restart perfectly, gunned it just before the last chicane, got a bit of a gap out of the chicane through the last corner, and then uh, job done, kind of, although it was never easy. Both he and Max went for fastest lap, both being on the soft tire at the end of the race. And it went to Max Verstappen, and I think that's a pretty fair assessment of what we saw today. Max, absolutely brilliant as well. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because let's go back to square one. Let's go back to Q2 yesterday when Lewis did that great lap on the medium tyre, but then was sent out on the soft tyre. He subsequently said that the team wanted both drivers to be on the same tyre, which was kind of odd because they were both out on the medium at the start. And because Valtteri didn't get a lap time at the start of Q2, they then brought Lewis back into, if you like, back into the, the red tyre zone. So he had to go out on the red tyre. So that wouldn't have been, that wasn't something about which he was happy for sure. And then onto the grid, there was another small incident with Lewis where he said there's still a lot of play in the movement, extra movement in the steering wheel, which is very unpleasant for any driver. You, apart from balance and grip and everything else, what you want in the cockpit is absolute perfection because there's no excuse not to have that, whether it be the footwell area, the driving position, whatever it is. And Lewis said uh, there's still excess movement in the steering wheel, which can be very irritating, I would imagine. And the, the message came back, um, well, he said, you know, why couldn't we change that? And the message came back, negative, Lewis, we couldn't, we weren't allowed to change it, which is an FIA scrutineering thing. But my point is, it seems rather odd to me that that point wasn't made to Lewis long before he got in the car. So he had time to think about it and put it into his digestion because it's quite an important element anyway um maybe maybe they did maybe that was just a radio thing just to <laughs> amuse everybody i don't know but it sounded very odd to me i mean in my experience in running drivers running race teams um if there's going to be something uncomfortable you let them know as soon as possible so they've got a lot of time to think about it and to as i say to put it into their system Anyway, it was a very, very good start as well. Both Mercedes quick off the line. I guess you could say Lewis slightly better off the line, bearing in mind he was on the dirty side of the road. And he was on the inside, so they were level going into the braking area. He just got ahead of Valtteri. And then uh, going into one, Lewis, yeah, a little, little bit of license, I think, saying, yeah, he subsequently said, well, you know, understeer, cold tires, you've ran wide. I don't think it was quite that bad. I think Lewis thought, right, Valtteri's on my left. Let's see what happens here. I'm just going to use all the road and a little bit more and squeeze him out. And in normal circumstances, a normal corner, that would have worked. But at the Nürburgring, you can have all that runoff area well beyond the track limit, if you like. And uh, of course, Valtteri stayed on the outside and then got the run, the acceleration run, into the next left-hander, uh, obliging Lewis to, to back out slightly and give him room. And I was thinking at that moment that uh, if, if, if the positions had been reversed there and Lewis had just done that to Valtteri, you'd be thinking, yeah, classic Lewis Hamilton. So that was a really, really good bit of driving by Valtteri to stay with it. Uh, and, and their ability to race that closely and not hit one another, I think, is a case study in how teammates can race. Sebastian Vettel and Mark Webber take note, <laughs> and a few others as well. I suppose Nico Rosberg as well, if you think about Barcelona. Anyway, yeah, a very, very good opening lap. After that, Lewis sort of dropped back. I think it was in a state of shock that Valtteri had been so aggressive and so good uh, through turns one and two. And tyres still not quite up to temperature, of course. Um, but once they got up to temperature, Lewis then started to close what was a one and a half second gap. He started to sit there, 1.3, 1.2, 1.1, 1.4, 1.1. Uh, and he was constantly there in Valtteri's mirrors, which wouldn't have been 
nice for Valtteri because Valtteri in his world was managing the tyres, the ambience were cold. Of course, they were coming up to temperature by then. But nonetheless, to have Lewis Hamilton in your mirrors that much would have been unsettling. And from, again, a case study on how to try to win a motor race when you've been blown away out of the first corner by the pole man, Lewis just sat there and he said afterwards, he, he made relatively light of it. He said, you know, I, I did a good job managing the tyres. I mean, he did a really good job managing the tyres at this stage because it's not easy when you're following another car. The best, the, the person best placed to manage his tyres in any given motor race is always the driver at the front with nothing hitting him. And, and Lewis there, he, he said he did a good job managing the tyres. Of course, the tyres didn't go off as quickly. They didn't grain as quickly as Valtteri's grained. But why was that? Again, I come back to my point, the point I've been making all year, really, and well, <laughs> for longer than all year, but certainly emphasizing in 2020, is Lewis's ability to use all the variables, mix them up, and to soften all the edges of everything that he's doing, to keep that billiard table absolutely stable, even while he's trying to keep the balls in the middle. Just brilliant to watch. And there were a few head-on shots where you saw them coming into various corners, and you could see Valtteri, there was a, always a slight edge to every movement, particularly going into the fast S's after the flat out Michael Schumacher S. You could see, you could see that Valtteri was junk and Lewis was just that beautiful smooth transition. And that when you're on the limit uh, in terms of ambient temperature versus what the tire can do, that is what can make a difference in terms of how quickly the tires start to grain. And that's what we saw. And from Lewis's point of view, when Valtteri then locked up into one uh, and ran wide and basically uh, <laughs> Lewis got past, well, not basically, he did, that was, that was absolute retribution for everything that had happened the day before. He'd done that great lap on the medium tyre. Valtteri had got the pole on the soft. Lewis slightly discombobulated at that point and hadn't done a great job in Q3 on the soft tyre as a result. And here we were. Lewis pushing Valtteri into that small mistake. Had Lewis not been in his mirrors, I don't think there's any way Valtteri would have locked up at that moment. And so it comes down to, yeah, real racing between the two teammates. And after that, Valtteri retired, of course, he lost power, but the race at that point was already firmly in Lewis Hamilton's hands. So very, very good drive by Lewis. As I say, thereafter, on the medium tyre, the tyre that he was so good on in qualifying in Q2, the beginning of Q2, he was really good because that's when the race against Max Verstappen was either going to happen or it wasn't. And although Max was pretty good and we didn't see much of the front end falling away as he'd be, as we'd been talking about during qualifying, indeed as he'd been talking about on, on Saturday morning, the Red Bull was pretty consistent and very, very quick. So Lewis had to do a perfect job at this moment, and he did. He loves that medium, he loved that medium set of tires, I would imagine, and, and he just managed to eke away a lead two seconds, three seconds, four, and eventually got up to about eight, nine seconds, and it was really impressive to watch that. That was Lewis at his very best in difficult conditions just using everything to his advantage and well not to his advantage just maximizing everything mixing it all perfectly and the same goes for Max Verstappen as well he was doing exactly the same thing in the Red Bull and then when um, it was Lando Norris eventually stopped having been told a million times to use whatever it was zero three default out of the corners because his engine was losing power and Lando I'm doing that I'm doing that brilliant he stopped coming out of the S's and uh, pulled over to the left the engines eventually stopped the uh, Renault engine in the McLaren, and um, <laughs> best moment of the race, without any doubt, Lewis, Lando climbed out and just sat down in one of the marshal's chairs and let them get on with it and lift the car up and safety car came out. Um, and three or four minutes later, he was still sitting there, helmet on, sitting there in the marshal's chair. Classic, I love Lando, brilliant, good to see. Um, so yeah, that was that. And then there was that sprint race to the end, which again was a different sort of race that, um, you know, very, very pressure filled race as well. Lewis Hamilton's got Max Verstappen behind him, everybody's back on new boots and, and it could have been could have been very, very close, but Lewis, did a great job there as well. So come back to this thing about driver of the day. I mean, how could you not say that Lewis Hamilton was driver of the day or indeed Max Verstappen or indeed the guy that finished third, Daniel Ricciardo. Early on, brilliant pass around the outside of Charles Leclerc's Ferrari. Charles, at this point, got to say the tyres were going off, and so it wasn't quite one-on-one. -on -one. But for, for, for Daniel to pass him on the outside, it was classic. Uh, it was down, outside of turn two, yeah, outside of turn two going into three. And that was just classic Daniel Ricciardo slicing through the traffic, 
the Daniel we know and love. And he's been, he's been re-emerging, blossoming, re-blossoming as that driver over the last five or six races. And um, yeah, just fabulous to watch. And later on, again, pressure from, 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 uh, for Daniel from Sergio Perez in the Racing Point. And I dare say, with all respect to Renault, the Racing Point actually probably a better racing car on the day. And both of them on new sets of soft tires, pretty good battle. You would have thought Sergio in that car could have got Daniel, but Daniel in, in the end just wore him down and pulled away. I'm talking about after the restart now on the soft tire. And so that was Daniel versus Sergio Perez. No contest, really. It was always going to be Daniel. Uh, really, really good drive. Sergio finished fourth, which uh, good for the team. You know, you could say troubled weekend. But equally, um, Nico Hulkenberg did a very good job, as predicted, got through into the points pretty comfortably and drove extremely well from the back of the grid. Classic Nico Hulkenberg and a very good result for Racing Point to have both cars in the points. I suppose you could say that, although... Uh, Ultimately, I think with a different driver, they might have got P3 there. If Daniel Ricciardo, for example, had been in the racing point, he probably would have been P3, I think, beating Sergio Perez in the Renault, if you want to put it that way. And then behind Sergio for fifth place, a rerun, would you believe, of the Italian Grand Prix, Pierre Gasly against Carlos Sainz. Again, you could say the McLaren probably the slightly better car. And on this occasion, Carlos had the track position. He was in fifth. Pierre Gasly pushed him very, very hard at the restart and very good race between the two of them. It was Carlos who did really to Pierre what Pierre did to Carlos at Monza, although it was only for fifth place. So I doubt that uh, in this, uh, on this occasion, Carlos would have been thinking about that at all. But a very good drive by both of them into fifth and sixth place. And P7, Charles Leclerc, who never gave up in the Ferrari. He went for what they call Plan C, which was starting on the soft, coming in for mediums relatively early, and then coming in for a second set of new mediums just before the safety car, which kind of ruined that plan. But nonetheless, he drove really well, just like Max and Lewis got absolutely the best from the car, and Daniel for that matter. Um, never saw him with a foot out of place anywhere. Uh, aggressive when he needed to be, really good in traffic when he was on uh, reasonably new tyres. And when he was on old tyres, very, very good in defence. One, It was one of these drives, and I've been saying this all year again, where when Charles is back in the position to win Grand Prix again in a, in a race-winning car, all this accumulation of road dust, of driving perfectly to finish seventh in the Eiffel Grand Prix, will all have its effect in his ability to win races again. And uh, just a pleasure to watch him all day. Superb drive, I thought. Some good racing right down the field, although there was also quite a lot of argy-bargy. Kimi Raikkonen and George Russell had quite a big coming together at Turn 1, for which Kimi got a 10-second penalty. And I think this brings to mind the whole business of today being on the outside of, of another driver and then the driver on the inside being guilty of causing an accident because the two of you touch. Uh, I think this really needs to be looked at more seriously because the minute you are on the outside of any other driver regardless of what sort of corner it is whether it's a hairpin medium speed high speed you are basically then in the hands of the driver on the inside and he's basically going to say i'm not turning until i feel like it you can do whatever you like on the outside there and we've seen it now several times lewis hamilton in austria we've seen it now with with kimi in in germany and i think that to penalize a driver for hitting a driver on your outside is difficult. I mean, Kimi genuinely, unlike Lewis at the first corner, had a moment. He definitely locked up and he definitely runs wide. The back end comes out a bit and he's kind of trying to hold the alpha. And there's George on his outside, admittedly giving Kimi as much room as he possibly can, but he is on the outside. So he is vulnerable to the driver on his right making a mistake or running wide. And, and yet Kimi got the penalty. And I, as I say, I think that needs to be looked at. I think if, they, if it's going to be clear from here on in that you can pass on the outside and if the driver you're passing decides to squeeze you he's going to get penalized i don't think that's motor racing i really don't and i think that you know that really needs to be looked at sebastian vettel had another torrid race finishing 11th and also spinning quite luridly into turn one when he was trying to go inside another slower car and braked hard as you do going into turn one with load on the car and just lost the rear in a very inelegant lose so these are not happy times for sebastian but it has to be seen in the contrast of what daniel ricardo is doing for renault when daniel was out of the car he was hugging the team the team were ecstatic they got their first podium i don't know how many years and he's leaving renault at the end of the year but you wouldn't know that 
because Daniel's a real pro, as a, as are the Renault team. Sebastian, I'm sure, is we got to say he's a pro, but the bottom line is his driving does seem to be going way off the clock compared with Daniel Ricciardo. And then there was that scene at the end of the race. I think there's any country you could choose in which Lewis Hamilton was going to equal Michael Schumacher's record of wins, 91. It would, of course, be Germany, Michael's home country. And the Nürburgring meant so much to Michael as the Michael Schumacher S is there. And of course, Mick Schumacher was due to make his public Formula One debut in the Alpha team in FP1. It never happened because of the rain on Friday. But Mick was there afterwards to present Lewis with one of Michael's helmets, one of his Mercedes helmets, it has to be said, appropriately so, to Lewis. And for the German crowd, for Lewis Hamilton, for Michael Schumacher, and for all the Schumacher family, it was a moment in time.